Now, what an interesting few matches we have had in the opening, uh, you know, games, I guess, for each of the teams. Uh, I must say that Japan played an exceptionally well game against Germany. Uh, it, it wasn't just, you know, a, a matter of whether uh, Japan was better than Germany. I don't think that, you know, that their players individually were better. But collectively, as a team, they had way more spirit. They were compact in the right areas. They were able to pressure the opposing team. I was worried that they might run out of steam in the second half. But no, they they really went to war. They kept their players together. They they brought all of their you know anime spirit and they really went to all out. I must say, um, they they knew how to operate well in the half spaces to threaten the opponent, and as well shut down attacks, uh, especially from Jamal Musiala, who was a bit of a threat on the left wing. They were able to really shut him down and force a lot of the uh, crosses to come in from Nabi. Uh, who was on the right wing, and eventually, you know, Germany did tactically, I would say, perform better than Japan because it's Germany. They have their structure, they have their one-twos, they know how to move the ball and how to move off the ball. And Japan lacked in that sense, uh, but they really fought together and they fought just harder than Germany, I must say. So it, it is quite impressive that Japan merely won by, you know, sheer effort. I think that's that's pretty much what won them the game. Now, looking at some of the ratings which I want to talk about, uh, in this game, I think I, we have to give kudos to Endo, who played really, really well controlling the midfield. And as I said before, midfield players, sometimes they're kind of undervalued, underrated, because you don't really see them on the score sheet, and you don't really see them uh, you know, blocking goals that often. So they pretty much just operate in a point where um, they're able to channel the defense to the attack, and it really comes down to, you know, their other abilities such as their tackling, their ball control, their, uh, what do you call this, interceptions. And some of these things are underrated, underrated, but I think Endo played an excellent game being able to control midfield and drive the ball towards Ito. And I think all of these players, including Itakura, completely shut down Musiala and prevented the left ring from causing too many problems. But uh, Gundawan is still such a good player. He was able to win back possession in the right spaces and really know how to drive the ball and find his passes. I think overall, Germany played a better game compared to Japan. As I said, uh, tactically as well, Germany is more structured. Their players are just more uh, intelligent in the way they play just because they, they're, they're you know, trained better. But Japan, with their sheer spirit and willpower, showed that um, you know as a team, they can perform better because they kept their heads together. They had the right mindset. They definitely brought their A game and they beat Germany. I think in the right circumstance, if Germany knew that they have to take this game really seriously and they have to play all out, they have to play um, as though you know they're playing against France or something, they would not have underestimated uh, their opponents and they would have taken them along a lot better. But I think Germany clearly showed some signs of you know taking it too relaxed, especially when they know they had the one goal lead that got that came from a penalty. Uh, they sort of sat back and tried to tire out their opponents. Uh, but it didn't really work in their favor because, as I said, Japan, with their sheer willpower, was able to come back and fight. And I absolutely enjoyed this match. It was such a good, uh, very well-played match. And what is even impressive is, despite the aerials one being more to the side of Germany, uh, considering they won 22 aerials compared to Japan's 12, I was still impressed with how Japan, especially Endo, uh, won some of the uh, important aerial pieces, I think, in the second half in midfield. Uh, preventing Germany from collecting the ball in midfield, and Ito as well won some on his wing, preventing Musiala from getting those balls. And I think this was really, really well played. Um, overall, I think some of the substitutes that came in, especially Yusufa Mokoko and Hoffman, uh, did seem to, uh, you know, I think put in some pressure into the game. Uh, but Japan managed to hold it in, and it really, everything really changed when Japan's substitutes came in, uh, and that includes Minamino. Joan, uh, Nitoma, uh, I think these players really, you know, changed the game and took it up a notch. And um, Minamino especially, who came in, I, I was pretty excited because, you know, he's a Liverpool player, of course. Uh, Minamino came in, provided a good pass into the right area to provide a, uh, to force Neuer into an important save uh, that allowed, uh, you know, I guess, uh, who was it the first one? Was it Joan? I think Joan's got the first one. Yeah, Ritsu Doan was able to pounce on that and uh you know get the first goal and that was really important it brought japan's spirit up showing you know them that you can actually score against germany and you might even be able to beat them 
and the other substitute Asano as well come in to uh, buff up the of offense, you know, and 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 this is very interesting because um, you know it, it forces Japan to to think in a more offensive manner, not just sit back. And I think those substitutes really meant that Japan knew that they can't just sit back even after one goal uh, when they you know when they know that they can put the pressure and win the game. And so Japan went for the win when Germany was just trying to poke and prod. Uh, and to be fair, uh, even in terms of opportunities, Germany had way more. They created a lot more opportunities. They, they dominated possession. And I think Japan was fine with Germany dominating possession just because Japan know that they can't hold possession against Germany, especially in those midfield areas with Kimmich and Gundogan, uh, because those players are very, very good in intercepting, uh, intercepting uh, passes, key passes especially, uh, that may drive an attack in the center. And Rudiger was, is extremely fast, uh, very athletic, physically very, very capable of taking on any opponent. And he was just playing around with some of the attacks that came in from Japan. And I think it, you know, it, it really came back to haunt them because, uh, you know, all the, you can see Rudiger is just having fun with some of the Japan's attacks. You can see him dancing around, showing off like, hey, you can't beat me in a speed, you know, you can't beat me. Uh, but trying to, you know, uh, challenge me, my pace, it's impossible. And he knows it, and that's true. Japan really did not need to beat them by pace. They beat them by pure uh, skill, persistence, uh, time, and talent. They really pressured Germany into making errors in the right places, and they took advantage of that. And I think this is, you know, this sort of feeds into the Gegen Press style of playing, uh, where eventually forcing your opponent to make mistakes using high-pressure pressing uh, really worked against Germany and really worked pretty well because Germany is the kind of team that likes to poke and prod and tactically try to uh, overcome you with the key passes in the right areas, especially threatening the half spaces and then getting balls driving in over crosses or below. And I think this shows that uh, the pressing style actually manages to beat them in the right spots, gain possession or even get key passes in just to get the goals. Uh, so yeah, it's a very, very interesting game. But as you can see, the tackles in terms of the team's differences, Japan had very, very important tackles, especially uh, especially by Endo. I think he, he, he was really impressive, some of the tackles he managed to get in. Um, but yeah, this was a really cool game. Uh, but that's not just it. I think some of the other teams, uh, the Asian teams are playing exceptionally well this year. And yeah, wow, well, like, wow, Asia, like, keep going. Like, don't stop, like prove the world that it's not just, you know, football is not a one-sided game. and there, There's a lot more uh, in the rest of the world to give as well. South Korea, I thought, also played a pretty impressive game. Now, first of all, not to take anything from Uruguay, they they definitely were the better team, I would say. Uh, but I think South Korea put off a fantastic display of a good team uh, in, you know, they were also, I think, not as compact as the way Japan played. Japan definitely showed more control. Uh, South Korea, they were able to put, you know, they were almost, I think, playing in the same level of Uruguay in terms of passes and possession, uh, in terms of the way they uh, were getting their shots away, you know, tackles in the right places. They they were, they were looked like a little, you know, this was pretty much, a, I would say, in terms of quality, pretty equal. And it's really impressive to say that South Korea can put up such a high quality game uh, against a team like Uruguay, who has players like uh, Valverde, Bentacur, Rodrigo Bentacur, uh, Nunes. Suarez, uh, you know, even Oliveira, like all these players are like top class players and to be able to play at their level, it's, it's really impressive. So kudos to South Korea as well, uh, really keeping up with their neighbors, Japan and showing the world that Asia can surely do this. Um, you know, so uh, fair enough, it was a goalless uh, draw. Regardless, uh, I think it was a pretty decent game. Uh, in terms of the game quality between Germany and Japan compared to Uruguay, one thing very interesting about Germany and Japan is that with a lot of good tackles and interceptions, Germany were dispossessed a total of 18 times, making this one of the worst games that Germany has played uh, in terms of managing the possession that they had. 73% possession and being dispossessed 18 times is a very, very weird stat. It means that you're being dispossessed so frequently uh, in key areas and not being able to get your you know uh, passes across and that's very very scary and if you look at the areas that they lost possession it's not exactly in the opponent's, opponent's defense these were all midfield battles and that's a very important difference to remember if you lose a lot of your uh, your uh, possession in like at the opponent's back line that's extremely understandable because you're trying to get your shots away defenders are coming into block uh, and you, you don't really have many 
passing options uh, around you in these areas. You have to be really like you have to overload those areas to get those passes in. So it was inter interesting that Japan actually managed to win back a lot of those possessions in midfield because they were just you know much more pers uh, persistent. Uh, and Germany actually got dispossessed a lot frequently in terms of uh, like Skodderback, Gundogan, Kimmich. Uh, and the one who got dispossessed the most was obviously Musiala, who was completely shut down, uh, I think, by Endo and Ito, who did a fantastic job on that right wing. So, yeah, this is a very interesting stat for Germany. Uh, this is not a normal occurrence, I must say. Germany does not get dispossessed like this um, ever. I, I don't think I've ever seen them this week. Uh, but it's not to say Musiala did not play well. He is still a threatening player. But I think Japan just played better than him, showed more experience considering Musiala's age and inexperience in terms of just his playing time, you know, overall. Uh, I think Japan was just able to show that, hey, you know, kid, you don't stand a chance against this. And that really, really showed. Uh, and as for Uruguay as South Korea, it is a little bit more unique in the sense where both teams played very equal matches uh, in terms of their dispossession, uh, the tackles especially. Uh, I think both teams also played excellent midfield, midfield games. Rodrigo Bentacor is just such an impressive player just to watch on the field. He reminds me of the quality of Zidane puts in for France. Um, or, or uh, I guess, um, what's that Barcelona, Barcelona player? Um, uh, I guess it's Sergio Busquets, right? Yeah, it's Busquets. Busquets is like one of, one of the most interesting players to watch in midfield. And I think Rodrigo Bentacur is, is, you know, most definitely a player comparable to Sergio Busquets. He's, he's, he's re but he's a little bit more offensive in terms of his play style for sure. Uh, he, he doesn't mind getting into the right areas to take a shot if he needs to. But look at his defensive ability. His aerials 1 is 2, his tackles is 3. Uh, he was dispossessed 2 times because he was trying to get some key passes in. But it's absolutely fine. He managed to win 1 dribble. Uh, his pass succession is 88%. His possession 7.8. I mean, this guy is just brilliant in midfield and it's such a pleasure to watch. But uh, and the interesting thing is, despite all that, uh, South Korea had a very compact 3-man midfield. A triangle for sure and they were able to use that to their advantage by not needing to uh i mean to, they basically put pressure on the flanks with three players uh you know moving in together and that's a very interesting way to play it um i mean it, it's almost similar to how uruguay plays it as well except south korea's attacking midfielder drops pretty deep jason actually drops pretty deep to assist in midfield and i think it pretty much brings back the same formation except uju is sitting up really higher forward uh, compared to Suarez and Nunes. Uh, and while Nunes does run down quite frequently to assist Vecino, it's not just not the same way South Korea does it because they have more players back. And so I think South Korea built it such that they need to focus more on their defense. And so they did have more players being able to be in deeper areas to, to win midfield battles compared to Uruguay who wanted to dominate the wings. Um, so this is also a very interesting, I guess, midfield versus wing kind of, battle this is just a tactical thing uh but yeah it, it played off quite well for both teams i would say uh the one unfortunate thing i didn't really see is any exceptional individual talent besides rodrigo bentecourt uh i mean godin sure yes he did well he he he, he uh even got a shot away he, he you know got a lot of aerials won but he wasn't really in the right places to get any interesting tackles in it he didn't really win back possession or anything like that exclusively it, it was pretty much more so uh, a midfield fight uh, but yeah, very, very cool game, I must say. South Korea being able to hold off Uruguay to a, to a goalless draw, I think this is exceptional um, from Uruguay. Uh, but yeah, pretty, pretty cool match. Another one is Brazil versus Serbia, which is, I think, a lot more straightforward. Brazil were clearly the better team, uh, and they clearly deserved to win with the number of chances they created, the number of shots they, they, they had. Uh, it was insane. This was pretty much a firing match versus Serbia's goalkeeper. And, I mean, honestly, Serbia has an absolutely brilliant goalkeeper. Uh, Milankovic Savic. Uh, like, dude, this guy was insane. Like, I, I did not know they had such a good goalkeeper. I, I don't remember if this guy played in the last uh, World Cup, but I think, you know, my memory could be failing me. But uh, I must say, what an, what an amazing goalkeeper this guy was. Uh, but here's the thing. A lot of these shots were not necessarily on target out of the 22 shots if you look at it only eight were actually on target but a lot of these shots did in fact threaten the defense and they forced them to be alert and on their toes at all times and uh, this was interesting because serbia despite having showing a three-man defense lineup they actually had i think a five man because zikovic um 
Mladenovic and even uh, Godeji actually dropped quite deep to help to win some tackles. Uh, and yeah, that was, that was interesting to watch. I think Serbia played a pretty good defensive game despite being just rained down by Brazil who played a very, very powerful high line and very, very powerful offensive game. And uh, yeah, Serbia really struggled against this. Uh, Mitrovic barely had any usable chances. Uh, he had absolutely zero shots uh, provided and I mean, I think Brazil completely shut down Uruguay, to be honest. The ones who actually got the shots away were some of the backliners who came in later to try, you know, like, give their best attempts. But look at this. None of those shots were on target. That's just how bad Serbia had it. Um, and yeah, I mean, Brazil showing their defensive prowess while being able to be offensive and uh, show that they are very, very aggressive in key areas. I think this is just a domination match by Brazil versus Serbia, um, which is very interesting because a lot of people, like I, I, I believe that a lot of people think that uh, Brazil is one of the uh, teams that's going to go all the way to the final. And I do know that statistics-wise, some people do think Brazil can win this potentially. I would say that it's a slim chance Brazil could win it, but they're going up against teams like France, uh, the Netherlands, who are still excellent offensive teams. Uh, and even Spain, who whose match was absolutely disgusting, which I'll be showing you in a bit. Uh, but yeah, here's Portugal versus Ghana. This was a pretty cool match. Um, so first of all, Portugal versus Ghana, I think, uh, I mean, this has to go to, uh, I mean, I, I think this has to go to Bruno Fernandes, who, who played a really, really good, uh, you know, game tactically, offensively. He, he was really there in the key areas, able to get in to the right places, get the key passes. Like, if you just look at uh, Bruno Fernandes, he's getting key passes. Uh, but it's not just ordinary key passes. Look at his pass succession. This is absolutely insane. He has 51 passes. Considering his position, he's not a defender to just pass around the box. He's actually getting key passes in to offensive areas uh, where... Uh, Liao is, Ramos is, um, yeah, it, it's really interesting. Yao Felix was, Ronaldo was, uh, and look at it, like looking at his pass succession, his passing rate. I think, like, this was a masterclass from Bruno Fernandes, he played exceptionally well. Uh, but yeah, it, it's not just that. Uh, we, we also have to give kudos to Cristiano Ronaldo, who I think really showed that the man can still play football, guys. Like, why? United benches him. I mean, I mean, I, I understand that United wants to do their own thing. They don't want Ronaldo because they want to build their offensive gameplay and they want their pressing style and Ronaldo is not very good at pressing. Look at Ronaldo's rating right before he was subbed off. He was better than not only the entire opposing team. He was better than Portugal's team except for Bruno Fernandes. Like, yes, he fought one penalty. He got four shots off. Right, out of the four shots, two us on target, so it's a fifty percent on target shots. But out of those, out of those, uh, out of the four shots, one of it is actually blocked. So that's actually three. That's seventy five percent succession in his shots. That man can also jump, like I don't know, some kangaroo. He he can literally jump higher than the goalposts to win balls and headers. And I think he got a very good header off in the early part of the first half, but unfortunately he couldn't get it on target. But I think that was the one that was actually missed or something. Uh, but dude, it's still really, really impressive. Look at his passing succession, despite being a forward. Uh, very, very interesting stat. You don't really think about it, but he's got 18 passes and 78% uh, percent of uh, passing rate. As a striker, that's insane. That, that's, that's literally few people in the world who can get passing succession rates like this, um, being a striker. So Ronaldo also drops deep when really needed, but he likes to sit in the box and be more so of a poacher. And that's just the way he plays. But the fact that he can still come into Portugal, win a penalty, score the penalty, contribute to the rest of the game, be a offensive pressure, threaten the opposition, be in the right areas to get the hitters, means that, so what if he's 37? He's still one of the best players in the world. And Manchester United, whatever happened there, it's just super unfortunate. I don't really want to poke and prod too much about it, but I think we all heard the news. Um, fine, you want to ban Cristiano Ronaldo from playing for his club. 
that's unfortunately the terms of the contract and the decision and Ronaldo should not have done that uh, I think the outburst was uncalled for but despite all that the fact that he can still play for his country get goals and contribute and have a rating of 7.4 in a match like this uh, sure it's just Ghana I get it it's just Ghana but don't make fun of Ghana those guys are in the World Cup some countries are not even there and despite that this guy can contribute at the international level continues to rack, rank or like uh, increase his goal count it's it's still impressive like so we can't take anything away from ronaldo uh and we can't take any anything away from the rest of the match uh, which has played really well i think uh liao is it is that where you pronounce it liao leo uh was also a very interesting player to see but i think i like no wait not mario who was in his place before mario got subbed in uh no mario didn't didn't do very well there's another player in his place before mario got subbed in Yao Felix, right? Yeah, it's Yao Felix. Okay, Yao Felix actually played an excellent game. I think that, um, I think he played better than Ronaldo, to be honest. Uh, but I don't know what's what's causing the difference in terms of the rating. It could be the past succession or something, because one thing about Yao Felix is that he likes to beat his man. So in one-on-one -on -one situations, it's a little bit more difficult to get ratings because you often will lose possession, um, and you can't really get that many passes off. So. But the funny thing is, Ronaldo is the one that got dispossessed twice, and Yao Felix didn't. This is actually quite interesting. I didn't know that. I thought he actually lost the ball in a few places, but maybe it wasn't because he got out, like got beaten by his man. I think it's more so he just uh, lost possession when he tried to uh, get his passes off. Uh, so that explains his 76% passing rate. So he got more of intercepted rather than dispossessed. That actually makes more sense. Yeah, but I think that Yao Felix actually played better than Ronaldo and should deserve a slightly higher rating. As for Ghana's team, I think that uh, before Bukhari came in, actually, uh, where is midfielder? Kudus, right. Kudus played an excellent game. I think Kudus was a very interesting player to play. Um, I'm not sure what club he plays for. I don't really follow this guy. But uh, I think Kudus was a really interesting player to see on Ghana's midfield. Uh, and they also had a very, I mean, they really built for this. They went a five-man defense and they knew they had to uh, hold up. Jarek Lamte, of course, everyone knows this guy. Uh, excellent player. But I don't think he performed well enough uh, considering the time he was given on the, on the pitch. Uh, I think it was more so, wait, where is the Seydou, right, who was there before Lamte, then actually played a much better game on the right flank. Lamte came in, uh, decent substitution, especially to given, I mean, considering Seydou's time and uh, how he has been playing. I think it was not really a necessary substitution. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe he could have been able to uh, keep playing even with the card. Uh, but having Lamte in, fine, it changed the match a little bit, but I don't think it really changed too many things because Lamte was not able to really define that right wing any, any more different. Uh, Bukhari came in, sure, got the goal, um, but I, I personally think they could have played a better midfield match. It's just that I think Ghana didn't really have much uh, offensive ability in terms of their front line, so Bukhari coming in to get that goal was pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, Ghana actually had an opportunity to equalize, and I think that they could have got away with it uh, because they played a really good game against Portugal overall. Uh, but in terms of just uh, the stats, I think Portugal do deserve to win because they did get better shots off, uh, played a little bit better in key areas. But not to take anything away from Ghana, I think they really, really um, deserve an equalizer maybe. Um, and if they had a chance, they could have actually won the match. I really like the, um, the Ronaldo celebration. Um, by one of the Ghana players, I think it's Bukhari, right? Bukhari did the uh, Ronaldo celebration or something. Uh, it's just hilarious. I think that was, that was I, like, I did not expect that to come from anyone, but that was pretty cool. Uh, Bukhari, yeah, Bukhari actually did the celebration. That was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, Ghana showing that they can be themselves and still, uh, you know, take the loss if they have to. But it's not over. I think Ghana still has an opportunity to get higher up in the group if they play the rest of the match as well. Uh, and I think Portugal really has to play a little bit better, take it up a notch if they want to survive against teams like uh, France, Brazil, um, and even Germany, if Germany puts on some form. Uh, it's kind of scary what Germany can actually be when they take the game seriously. So that's pretty much it. Uh, as for the last team that I wanted to cover here is Spain versus Costa Rica. Now, this was an absolutely disgusting match. I think Spain should not uh, bully a smaller country like this. It's just not fair. 
Uh, but to 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 be honest, uh, I think it was it was just a show of masterclass from Spain, uh, proving why they are an absolute threat. Uh, but to be honest, Costa Rica, you know, they they may have been able to pull off a better defensive game if they uh just had a little bit more quality. Considering I think the midfield was decent, it's just the defense couldn't hold up. And Spain just has such brilliant players, very very offensive players like Torres. Who I think, th I think this guy does nothing to to stop when he gets the ball and he's charging at the goal. He he will do everything in his ability to try to beat his man and get to the goal post. If if he can literally run through the goal post, he might just do it. Um, but yeah, he got dispossessed twice uh, in key areas, which is fine. It's absolutely understandable considering uh, he's an offensive player. Uh, his passing succession is also pretty low because he always likes to get key passes in. Got two shots off. Very interesting player overall. Uh, but here comes the uh, cooler stat. Uh, the bulk of the shots actually came from Marco Asensio, the striker. Uh, nothing unusual there. But let's look at Asensio a little bit. Asensio managed to get five shots off, uh, which you know is is ideal for a striker. Three of those were unfortunately off target, uh, making his, his his accuracy not very offensive. But if you actually look at the game, those were pretty close to the goal itself. It's not really too far off. So I would say. Given everything, Asensio played a decent match. It's just that um, he, he wasn't able to utilize his presence really well because he likes to stay up forward too much, doesn't really drop deep as much as a lot of other strikers do. And so he leaves a lot of the work to uh, Torres and Olmo and just waits for the ball, I guess. Um, yeah, but this is the way he plays. I mean, I, it's understandable. Uh, I think later on, wait, who, who gets subbed in? Uh, Nico Williams. Is it? Uh, let's see. Um, Nico Williams gets subbed in. Morata gets subbed in. Yeah, I think Morata is. I mean, for me personally, I think Morata is just a better player, hands down, compared to Asensio. I, I mean, sure, Asensio is great. Uh, I don't know. Don't 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 hate on me. Just just take it easy. Uh, I think Morata is just hands down a better player. Uh, but it could be the other way around, and I would agree with you. I'm not saying that uh, Sensio is not a good player or anything like that. Sensio is brilliant, but Morata is just, I feel, just, just better uh, overall. And I think he should have been given a lot more time. I, I'm not sure if he's coming back, returning from injury or something like that. Uh, but I don't know. I think they could have just kept him all the way. Uh, see, let's see the substitution come in at the... Uh, where was it? Morata came in at... Who was that? Alvaro Morata. Bergavi at the 74th minute. Asensio moved to the right wing. Asensio played on. Uh, and then he got stopped by Nico Williams. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. I mean, it's just a little tactical change that they had. Uh, but, I mean, it didn't change the fact that Brazil is... I mean, sorry, Spain is still a huge threat. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter ex exactly how much substitutions they make. They have quite a decent amount of depth. I don't think so much in, in midfield. I think Sergio Busquets and Gavi are just too good of players. Uh, and there's not really any substitutes that could do what they can do. I think overall they're just excellent. Even Pedri is just such a brilliant midfielder. Like Brazil, like Spain's midfield is scarier than Brazil's midfield. Uh, honestly, and Brazil has a really scary midfield. Like Casemiro, I mean, dude, this guy's. This guy is just like I think it's I think it's the best midfielder hands down in this um in the whole World Cup if you ask me I I think Casemiro might be the best player um but regardless Sergio Busquets I mean this guy you know skill experience he has everything uh and he has the perfect toolkit to be the right man to control Spain's midfield so it's nice to see him there but uh Gavi Pedri these the you know these three together I think might be the strongest midfield collectively uh this world cup and surely one to watch and i can't wait to keep seeing it because spain offensively they're terrifying uh we couldn't see too much of their defensive abilities because costa rica got zero shots <laughs> they they completely shut costa rica down which is which is really really just unfortunate for them but i mean this is a bully match i think spain like come on this is your second team or something it's costa rica guys but whatever, uh, interesting matches overall. Uh, thanks to Whoscourt for coming up with this amazing website, providing these amazing statistics. Uh, it's really nice to 
have something where you can collect all of this information. Also, just an update to you guys about if you're wondering what happened to the video uh, of the uh, VAR offside thing. So FIFA has been hunting me down. They they have been trying to to uh, copyright claim all of my football videos, which means I can't really continue reviewing any of these games if this goes on. So I have to rely on uh, statistic sites like these if I want to actually talk about the matches. Uh, but when it comes to reviewing VAR footage, I think I might only be able to use maybe uh, a photo or two, uh, photo from fans, um, you know, these kinds of screenshots, maybe those sorts of things. I don't think I can actually utilize uh, the videos themselves because FIFA will hunt me down, and I, I can't really, I can't really argue with them. Despite saying that my video is transformative, despite saying that I can't make a review of a video without the video. You know, because my channel is small and people, quite frankly, don't care about that. You know, if, if they can copy strike you, they can, they can um, ban your video, block your video, they'll do it because they feel that they already have partners who have rights to distribute their video. So there's no way that they would want to allow, even though it's perfectly legal to use it under the terms of fair use, uh, I think they just want to be annoying and irritating and uh, challenge you. And I think they could, like, even if I want to challenge them back, it's kind of pointless because they could say, uh, we'll, we'd rather have a case with you and take me all the way to court. And I wouldn't want to be able to pay for that. Uh, and there's no pro bono lawyer that would waste their time either, knowing it's a YouTube case against FIFA. Uh, so it's kind of pointless for me to want to even challenge those um, copyright claims. So I'm doing my best to see whether YouTube does help me out as I keep putting these... Uh, uh, challenges against some of those claims but if FIFA comes back and says no we still believe that we have the rights to the video and you're not allowed to even review the video even under the terms of fair use and transformative purposes then there's really not much that I can do other than continue to challenge the video uh, but if it goes all the way to the point where they say that if you want any further challenges you have to make a case against this I don't think I'm going to pursue it further I really don't have the time or energy or the money to do that and so it's just, yeah, it's just a waste of my time, honestly. Uh, so for those of you who did drop by my channel to check out some of this VAR footage, thanks for stopping by. But let me just give you the heads up that um, they won't be around for very long because FIFA will hunt me down. And I don't stand a chance against their, uh, their bots, their humans. They're just too good. They will be able to pick and prod and find the right frame to tell me that, no, this is our video. You can't review it. Uh, take it down. There's really not much I can do. So yeah, this yeah, I just had to get that out of the way because there's really no way I can continue reviewing anything if that's going to keep happening. And I'd rather just get back to what I used to do, which is play my games, talk about my movies. Um, so if there are more third-party sites that you know will allow me to review the footage, maybe I could have a look at that. But unfortunately, none of them really cover uh, VAR. They don't really have those kinds of off-site. Um, decisions there might be i may have to dig it up on reddit or something but i'll eventually look for one and maybe i could uh try to cover that i think it might be easier to just look for a video on reddit that covers the vr video and then cover that instead as my review so i'm actually reviewing a reddit post rather than official footage um on youtube from fifa maybe that would protect me i'm not sure uh, because the way these copyrights work is I always notice bigger channels get away with everything, especially top 10 channels like Watch Mojo or something. I haven't watched that, that, that channel in a long time, but Watch Mojo gets away with a lot of things. They, could, they have an army of people working for them with the number of ideas they show up. What top 10, uh, you know, top 10 kitty cat cosplay costumes made by men. They, they could get away with all sorts of videos, uh, ideas because they have such a huge team working behind them. But more importantly, especially when they make top 10 animes, top 10 uh, movies, top 10 clips, top 10 uh, Marvel scenes. They like to milk Disney and Marvel for sure. But all those scenes, they get away with those copyright chances because they, they've been doing it for so long. They're such a huge double channel. They're protected by YouTube pretty much. YouTube knows that they make a lot of money off WatchMojo. And so they always back up WatchMojo and yeah, they, they can survive. And they also, I'm sure, have gone up against a lot of... Um, Copyright strikes, uh, lawsuits, and whatever, but they have the ability to challenge those things. But hey, guys, I got like, what? What do I have? Like a few hundred subscribers? I don't stand a chance. Um, 
So yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks so much for dropping by and joining me. Just giving you guys a heads up if you thought that I could long-term review footage and videos and whatever. May not be the case. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks, guys. See you guys. Take care. Uh, have a great few. Have a great weekend, I guess. That's you know the upcoming. Uh, but more importantly, keep enjoying these matches because this is the World Cup.